Dr. Rao received his Bachelor of Science degree in major physiology and Doctor of Medicine degree from McGill University. He went on to complete his family medicine residency at St. Joseph's Health Center at the University of Toronto. He subsequently completed his fellowship in faculty development at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He is also a graduate of the Physician Leadership Program at the University of Pittsburgh, where in 2008 he received the Dean's Master Educator Award. Dr. Rao is the author of multiple books, including Rational Medicine Decision Making, a Case-Based Approach, and currently does research on improving the diagnosis of hypertension in children. He is the current Editor-in-Chief of the journal Childhood Obesity and Nutrition. He is a Jack H. Medali Endowed Professor and the current Chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rao. Thank you, Corinne. It's always nice to be introduced by a former student of mine. So, um, so uh, I just you know this is going to be quite uh, quite a kind of a thirty thousand foot overview of a very very important and emerging area in research. Uh, and I know a lot of you are of different plans, uh, you know, it's gastroenterology, um, nephrology, other other sorts of things. But how many of you really at this point see making research an important part of your career? Keith. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just just a few people. Um, so let's let's. Uh, and that's, that's always encouraging to hear because we certainly need people that are um, interested in research. So after attending this brief session, you should be able to accomplish the following: define implementation science and other key terms associated with implementation science. Explain the need for implementation science in today's rapidly changing healthcare environment, and develop a basic outline to prove a significant problem in primary healthcare delivery. And I've chosen one that I think most of you will be able to relate to using principles of implementation science. So this has been written about many times in JAMA and other journals. It takes an average of 17 years for evidence-based practices to be incorporated in a widespread way into routine clinical practice. Any, any thoughts as to why that is? That's true. Right. Right. So we have our own heuristics, our own practice, you know, practice patterns, and it's largely based on where we do residency. You can, yeah, anyone you talk to who's an attending is say, well, when you know, back in St. Louis, this is what we used to do. You hear that all the time, and that becomes very entrenched. Any other reasons? Yes. Good. Good point. So, yeah, so to make practice changes, not just that this is better, but wait, you know, the system has to work around it. Anything else? I don't want to be the first person on the train. There are a lot of preparing for 17 years where they're around. You don't want to be 50 years, um, and you don't want to be, uh, you don't want, yeah, it's true. And, and, uh, and the research we've done in Chicago shows that with, with a number of issues. The people who've gotten burned with certain new types of medications, for example, tend to be more reluctant to prescribe newer medications in general. I'm going to throw out another concept to you, and that is the idea that it probably should take some time for us to incorporate uh, new research findings into practice. We probably shouldn't all be jumping on the bandwagon. And there's, an important, there's important reasons for that. If an iPhone, uh, what's the iPhone up to now, 7? Okay, how many of you bought the iPhone 7 on the first day it came out? Okay, how many of you have an iPhone 7? Okay, a couple of couple of you. Dr. Armitage is always on, on, on. He's, he's an early adopter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, you, you think about it, well, why didn't we all rush out and buy it? Because it's supposed to be better, right? More memory, better screen, better camera, uh, faster, etc. Sorry? You're on call? Yeah, you didn't have time? Okay. What other reasons? It's the same thing, okay. <laughs> All right, so getting into technical details is true. But, but it, it's interesting because in order for you to move from an iPhone 6 to an iPhone 7, there has to be a distinct and clear advantage over what you currently have. If your phone is working perfectly well for your purpose, why on earth would you move on to something else? It's interesting that some of the research we've done on Coumadin, um, 
And you wonder to yourself, even, even from the patient's standpoint, you say to, to patients who've been on Coumadin for a number of years, there's a whole new class of medications out there. You don't have to go to the Coumadin clinic. The, the response is very predictable. You know, they're safer. They're just as good in preventing stroke. Wouldn't you want to be on them? And, and one of the responses from uh, an older woman that we interviewed said, no, I love going to Coumadin clinic. It's my only outing for the week. I get to socialize with my friends. We all talk about our atrial fibrillation. And, and you know, so you're going to take that away from me now. So the advantage has to be clear, and it has to be significant. So let's talk about implementation science. So we have the traditional research enterprise of clinical research, which is largely devoted to descriptive or mechanism-oriented studies or intervention studies on highly selected academic medical center-based populations. These are the sorts of things you'll read about in the leading journals. And there's little concern about the public health impact or impact upon clinical practice. So uh, if you looked at the New England Journal, I just looked at a random issue from November 3rd, ribociclib as first-line therapy for HR-positive advanced breast cancer. And this is wonderful. I'm sure it's a really good medication. But what I, you know, there's lots of things I'm probably not doing that I should be doing already, and for me to adopt this just based on one particular study um, is probably not going to happen. But that is where the research enterprise is concentrated. That's where we put our, most of our money. But this is now finally coming under significant scrutiny, especially through this article from, uh, from uh, last year in JAMA, The Anatomy of Medical Research, U.S. and International Comparison. So it talks about, you know, uh, increases in research funding, but then slowdowns, and this is all very familiar to, to people who've applied for NIH grants. But the important thing I think here is to look at. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, the important thing to look at is underfunding of service innovation and in health services research. It receives only five billion dollars, or 0.3 percent of total healthcare expenditures. So this is research on how do we improve practice, how do we improve healthcare delivery. That's 0.3 percent of the total or one twentieth of science funding. That has got to change in order for us to take better care of our patients. The conclusion from this article was new investment is required if the clinical value of past scientific discoveries and opportunities um, to improve care are to be fully realized. There's no point in continuing to discover new things or coming out with new therapies unless we have a way to incorporate them in, in practice in a systematic way. And how we do that is the focus of implementation science. So um, you've all probably heard of the term translational research. Uh, th there are many different schemes and slightly different definitions. We won't go through all of them in detail. But basically, the first level of translation is called a T1, and it refers to the translation of basic research to patients or bench to bedside. So you investigate a new treatment for heart failure in rats. It seems to do well uh, in reducing, um, I guess I can't say symptoms. Um, reducing their admission to the rat hospital uh, with fluid overload. Who knows, right? Um, and then you try it out, you test it out in humans to make sure it's safe and reasonably effective on a very, very small scale. And that's, typical, that's traditionally called T1 research. Uh, of course, extremely valuable, not the sort of research I've been involved in. And then there is the next level up, which is T2, which is translating from the bedside into clinical practice and across the system. And these are typically highly controlled trials. So the trials you read in JAMA or the New England Journal will fall into this category. Now we've shown something has some positive benefits in humans. Now let's scale up, let's randomize people to one treatment or the other and see how it works out for them. I think the, the area I'm most passionate about is T3. And this is, okay, that's great that it worked in a controlled research setting. You know, people were recruited very systematically. They had to meet certain criteria, they were paid. The investigators were very passionate about it. They were blinded, et cetera. That all showed that this treatment was great. Uh, but how does it actually work in practice where you've got patients that have various symptoms and, and all kinds of comorbidities and live in the real world? Uh, and that would be the category of dissemination research and implementation research, which is, which is the area that we're going to focus on. T4 is the next level up, which is translation into policy and population health, which we won't be touching upon today. The other terms I think that are important to, to realize that pertain to implementation science are efficacy versus effectiveness. So efficacy refers to whether or not whatever you're testing out works under ideal conditions. So you have higher internal versus external validity. You have highly selected populations and conditions of interest, very few comorbidities. So if I'm recruiting somebody for a new heart failure drug, I want people 
that no, nah, I don't want these diabetics and smokers and you know, people who are obese. I just want because I just want to look at heart failure. And they've got to all be men and women between the ages of 55 and 75. I don't want any really old people because they're going to get sick and drop out. So very, very highly controlled conditions. The intervention staff are highly qualified. If you don't come in for your research appointment, they will call, they'll probably drive you there, right, to make sure you get the medication that you, you're supposed to get. The outcome measurements can be extensive, and uh, the subjects are highly motivated to participate because they're volunteers for the most part. The effect in this trials are slightly different. We want to see how this intervention works in the real world. So <clears throat> people are selected for heart failure, but they can have other diseases. They're just your average heart failure patients who are, you know, obese, smoke, have diabetes, hypertension, other conditions. Um, the staff selection that you use for these types of studies are typical people who are practicing uh, and working in the community, and the outcome barriers are minimized. So quite a little, uh, quite a bit of a different uh, approach to things. Then we can take things a little bit one step further in the realm of implementation science. So when we design an efficacy study, let's say this, has, this is a hypothetical example of motivational interviewing for substance disorders in the homeless population, and that has got to be one tough study to do, as you can imagine, right? That can't be easy. But anyway, um, so the hypothesis in the efficacy category would be the MI beats control. Same thing for effectiveness. But implementation is completely different. We've already accepted that MI is a good thing in the homeless population, and it works. But we want to make sure that it is adopted and sustained, okay? So we're not necessarily focusing on the homeless population, per se, although that might be part of our focus. We're going to focus on clinicians. We're going to focus on the system, on nurses, on other features of the healthcare system that will make sure that we can uh, adopt MI and sustain it. So we come to our definition. So implementation science is the scientific study of methods to promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice, and hence to improve the quality and effectiveness of health services. Now, most of you are not old enough to remember the, the, the foundations of the EBM movement um, back in, um, I am guessing, probably early 90s. Uh, when the uh, user's guide to the medical literature started appearing in JAMA. I uh, must admit that I'm guilty of being part of all of that, but came around to a very skeptical approach. Um, Corinne knows that my approach to teaching is very different than, than, um, than in other places. But in any case, the initial idea that David Sackett and Gordon Guyatt had, and this is at McMaster, was that you could have an evidence cart and they would have papers in it uh, all kinds of papers. This is back in, you know, 25 years ago, so they didn't have the internet, at least not to the same extent we do today, but they keep papers and textbooks and other sources of evidence in there, and they would go on rounds, and if, if somebody had a question, they would look up uh, the, uh, the relevant paper. I don't know why, how they could possibly have the relevant paper all the time. Read it, uh, evaluate its validity, come up with an answer, and incorporate the answer into the care of that patient at that time. Now, any of you who've been on rounds know that that is not possible. Um, it's only a theoretical construct at best, although it has some value as well. So we've evolved from that to realizing that just having lots of high-quality information is not enough, that we need to have mechanisms to incorporate that information systematically into clinical practice, and that's the basis of, of implementation science. So we use a different lexicon, <clears throat> so implementation science versus quality improvement. You've probably heard those two, ter two terms a lot, and they are not synonymous with each other. Quality improvement usually targets a very specific quality problem that you identify within your system. So if across the UH, we say we have a very, very low percentage of patients who are getting their flu shot, um, you're not implementing a new intervention across the system. You're targeting that specific issue. You go out and you find out why is that the case, where are the barriers, and let's see if we can improve them. Implementation science is saying, okay, we need a way to incorporate this new flu shot into the system. Um, and, you know, it's a new high-dose flu shot we want to incorporate in the system. How do we do it systematically? So a little bit of a different approach. Diffusion. Does anyone know what diffusion means with respect to health services research or research in general? <laughs> Sorry? Spread of new information. Um, if we write it, they will come and use it. That's, that's the fundamental principle behind it. I publish an article, 
and everybody's going to read it, and they're going to do exactly what it says. It is uh, pretty pretty much fantasy, right? Um, and that, unfortunately, you know, when you think about the foundations of EBM, okay, well, we have this information, and we have experts who are going to critically appraise it, and then we're going to put it out there. Why aren't things improving? Well, this doesn't make sense. Um, that is not how physicians learn. That is now not how practice changes by any stretch of the imagination. Now, what's the difference between diffusion and dissemination? The next term up there. Any ideas? Yeah. Oh, I thought somebody has a comment. Okay. So dissemination is slightly different. It's actually targeted delivery of information to those who need it the most. Right? So dissemination is more of an active process. So if it comes down to I've got a new therapy for heart failure and I think it's wonderful, handing people, putting the New England Journal article in their resident mailboxes is one approach of diffusion and hoping this, this catches on. Probably not going to catch on. So you guys are probably really good, but most places it would not catch on. Dissemination is looking at um, which of you might have a lot of patients with heart failure and who could benefit the most from this new medication and whose outcomes are poor and really giving it to that, those relatively small number of people with some specific instructions on, I want you to read this, I want you to incorporate some of this into your practice or at least consider it. So it's a more active strategy. <clears throat> the next term is implementation intervention, which is some part of a larger strategy that's designed to improve the quality of care. So clinical decision support within the electronic health record system, that would be an example of an intervention. Uh, training nurses maybe to identify symptoms, that might be part of an intervention. Physician education can be an intervention as well. Quite different from a strategy. That's more of a comprehensive approach to improving a very specific problem. We're going to talk about an example of how we can do that today. So the distinction from clinical research, if this isn't absolutely clear, is that clinical research focuses on the health effects of an evidence-based practice. Implementation studies, by contrast, focus on the rates and quality of use of evidence-based practices. So it's all about uptake. Okay, we have assumed already that these things have a very uh, strong foundation, and we are moving past that to decide how we get them into practice. Okay, how do we evaluate the effects of uh, implementation strategies? Well, there, there are many levels of it. There's process evaluation, which is what I like to do, um, look at was everything delivered on time. So the, the, the study I have now is a cluster randomized trial um, based in Chicago, and it's called Improving Diagnosis of Hypertension in Children, something you guys don't deal with, but um, and it's multifaceted. And there are certain parts of it that have to take place, like the nurse committee has to meet on a certain Friday. Uh, you know, the handouts have to be given to the patient. So we can measure those processes and to see if those are actually happening. There's something called a formative evaluation, which means halfway through, or as we go along, we decide to see, well, are physicians doing a better job of diagnosing hypertension and managing it in kids or not? Okay, if they're not, let's look at what centers within the study are not doing so well and see what the problems are, and that's formative. Of course, summative means at the very end, we evaluate the overall effect of the strategy. There's also the very, very complex um, terminology around theories, models, and frameworks. So if I asked you, if I told you, for example, let, let me give you an example of, of uh, something that in my you know, younger days I was very naive about, but I thought that um, if you paid people to quit smoking, they would just do it, right? And I said, hey, you know, because we, we I, this is in Pittsburgh, we bought these uh, codeine machines. Um, I don't know who bought them. Uh, but somebody bought them, and we said, let's, let's design a study around this. We'll get our patients to quit smoking, because you know, it's, it's so hard to, for them to quit smoking. And I'll tell you what, you quit for seven days, you get $10. You quit for 30 days, you get 50 Quit for three months, well, you, get a, you get a drawing for a big prize or something like that. And, and uh, it's going to work, for sure, right? And uh, I was working with one of the fellows at the time. I said, yeah, this is a great idea. He was really, really excited about it. What do you think? Would that work? Why or why not? Well, let's say that let's say it's enough to uh, to make it worth their while. 
whatever it happens to be. What have I not thought about? The what? Dishonesty? Can you explain? Well, no, we have a machine to, to detect if um, they've been using it or not. Physical dependence, yeah, okay. Anything else? Right. Yeah, yeah. So there's a number of factors we didn't take into consideration. The problem is, the fundamental problem is, we did not uh, incorporate any sort of underlying behavioral or uh, behavioral model or theory for the whole thing. So there are models of that type, and paying people to quit smoking works for a very short period of time in some cases, but for the most part, doesn't, because it doesn't look at what motivates people to smoke in the first place, uh, and what would motivate them to quit in the first place. So unless you understand the theory, the underpinnings of how behavior changes, whatever interventions you design are not going to work so well. That applies to individual patient interventions as well as physician-based health services interventions. Physicians are probably the most difficult population you can deal with, right? To change your behavior is very, very, very challenging. And so unless you have an underlying theory, whatever you design is almost certainly going to fail. So a theory is a set of analytical principles or statements designed to structure our observation, understanding, and explanation of the world. A model is a simplification of a phenomenon or a specific aspect of a phenomenon. Models can be considered to be theories with a narrow scope, and that's probably the best way to think about them because this terminology is, is really quite overlapping. A framework is more like a plan. Okay, I want to change something, and here's my plan, and here's the steps that I need to follow in order to implement a new intervention. So what about just common sense? I just gave you an example of smoking, uh, a, a smoking study based on f financial reward. Uh, you can use common sense sometimes. It might work. It might not work. The other problem with it is that you'll have a hard time explaining your reasoning for how you developed an intervention. So we, you know, I, I come across a lot of people who design health services, research interventions, new tools, uh, questionnaires, et cetera, and you say, okay, that's, that's great. Now, why are you asking this question number four, and where did it come from, and how do you know it's a relevant question? So those are the kinds of questions that you will encounter unless you have a very strong foundation in how to develop these sorts of interventions. So here is an example of a theory, social cognitive theory in psychology, holds that portions of an individual knowledge acquisition can be directly related to observing others within the context of social interactions, experiences, and outside media and influences. So in the world of obesity, this is a very popular theory. Okay, so obesity is contagious. Uh, so is smoking, incidentally. So um, you take someone who is uh, very slim and fit, and you put them in an environment of people who have unhealthy habits or overweight and obese, and yes, they start to adopt those habits uh, over time, and the vice and vice versa works as well. Uh, here's an example of a model. How many of you have heard of the chronic care model? A lot. Okay, so this this uh, uh, the the vision here is that multiple things uh, uh, are related to productive outcomes. So there's community resources health system resources, self-management support, delivery system redesign, decision support, and clinical information systems. When you approach some aspect of each of those things, you are more likely to result in productive interactions and improved outcomes. Now, the chronic care model has gone a little bit out of fashion in recent years, but I think nevertheless is a very simple and straightforward model for developing interventions. So applications in implementation science can follow different uh, models and frameworks these, this is all very um, nebulous territory, so there are process models, which is really a stepwise approach to things, determinant frameworks, which we'll look at in a second, classic theories, implementation theories, and evaluation frameworks. At the most recent count, and I was talking to David Aaron from the VA, whom some of you may know, there are now 61 implementation models and theories, 61. Um, how do you choose from one of them if you're developing a new health services research intervention. It's not easy. A lot of them have not been validated. So anyone can come up with a new one and says, you know, draw a few circles and say this is how you proceed to develop your intervention. But a lot of them have not been substantiated. There are never, nonetheless a few that are really, really important and popular, which I'd like to introduce to all of you. So you've probably heard, how many of you heard of the K2A knowledge to action model? Okay, some of you have heard of that. So this uh, begins obviously with identifying a specific problem 
selecting specific types of knowledge, adapting it to the local context, which is important, assessing barriers, selecting and tailoring implementation, monitoring use, evaluating outcomes, and sustaining the knowledge use. And all of this seems like very, very much like common sense, right? But the fact of the matter is when you design your intervention, you start with this in a very, very stepwise fashion. So, for example, if I have a new medication for heart failure and I have knowledge of it from a particular study, I need to adapt it to local circumstances here in Cleveland. So how might I do that? What might be important as a, to uh, cost. cost? Okay, yeah, cost, insurance coverage. You would say, okay, this is a, a new medication for heart failure. It's superior to what's out there. It's cost effective. And by the way, it's covered by some of the local insurers here in Cleveland. That would be very important, local knowledge, right? Okay. So then you move stepwise assessing barriers to knowledge use. How would you, um, how would you assess those barriers? Ask, yeah. Yeah, you can assess barriers uh, through some interviews saying, well, how do you get your knowledge about heart failure? What are the barriers for you? you say, oh, I don't have, everyone will say, I don't have time to do it. Or, you know, the papers are too long and stuff. Well, we can, you know, create a capsule summary for you. Or next time you have a heart failure patient, perhaps something could pop up on your screen in the EMR saying, hey, you might want to look at this. And then we select and tailor and implement interventions, which we'll talk about in a moment. And obviously, we tend to evaluate what we do. So here's a determinant framework, which is uh, probably uh, one of the more popular ones as, as well. A determinant framework says that certain factors determine the success of an intervention. Uh, they have either negative or positive influence. The three most important factors are the level or strength of evidence. So if you have a randomized trial that shows one new treatment that is much, much better than what's, ex what's existing already, that pushes it up here. The context, um, that's the environment that it's in. So if you have lots of people with heart failure who happen to be sick and your health system has made this a huge priority, um, that's high, that's going to push it up here. And obviously facilitation, that's how much you provide to the providers so that they can, they can adopt this new intervention. All of those will make a new intervention more successful. Uh, this, is a, another, uh, uh, this is another version of the same Paris framework. So it's evidence, context, and facilitation. So if you're ever writing a grant, you say, I've got this new intervention, I'm following this, following this particular framework, and here are the, the three components, and here's what I plan to do to address each of those. And the most recent version is a consolidated framework for implementation research. This says that uh, the success of an intervention moves in circles, from an outer circle to uh, an inner circle. So the characteristics of the intervention are important. The inner setting is the structural characteristics of uh, networks and communications, the culture within your institution, outer setting, patient needs and resources, external policies and incentives from insurers, et cetera, the individuals involved, and the implementation process. So if you're developing an intervention, you, you look at each of these that has been shown to be associated with success and talk about how you will address each specific factor. So let's, uh, let's kind of close out with one specific example, I think, that will be really uh, of interest. So, how many of you are familiar with the newer oral anticoagulants? Dabigatran, Zeralto, and whatever the new one's called. Um, Dabigatran is Pradaxa. And anyway, there's, there's four, I believe, now. Um, they do have some distinct advantages over Coumadin. In fact, you know, for some of us who've been practicing a long time, we couldn't wait for something new to come along, right? Now, Keith can probably attest to that. Because Coumadin was a real pain. Um, you know, you, you give somebody five milligrams and the INR is 10. You give the same person five milligrams to someone else and you don't know why it's 1.1, you know. What do you do with that? You constantly have to adjust it. Plus, these adjustments, they are not really of all that interest to, our, to us as physicians, are they? You know, you know, oh, give them 10, give them five. Um, and so lots of places started Coumadin clinics to deal with the specific issue. But that doesn't necessarily address all the problems with Coumadin. Clearly, your dietary in, uh, intake influences uh, the, uh, the blood thing, splitting effects of Coumadin. Uh, furthermore, there's a significant risk of bleeding. You know, you've probably all seen patients with very, very high INRs coming into the hospital, I mean, people being carried on uh, very gently to their, to their beds. That's, that sort of thing happens all the time. So there's a, lot, a number of problems. The cost of monitoring is, is significant as well. Um, 
and even though they are undoubtedly effective in preventing stroke when they're indicated, such as in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So, these newer oral anticoagulants were introduced, I believe, in 2010. So it's been six years. What, what do you think the uptake has been? Very modest. Yeah, surprisingly modest. Okay, um, not as bad as so. My research is in, in primarily in obesity. The obesity, the newer obesity drugs have been adopted in dismally low levels. And that has a lot to do with uh, the FenFen issue from the 1990s. A lot of physicians uh, really got burned. So despite all the advantages of the newer oral anticoagulants, um, the uptake has been very modest. The majority of patients uh, who were taking Coumadin before are continuing to take Coumadin. That's not surprising because, you know, you've got to switch, switching people over, et cetera, is, is a bit of a challenge. But here's the surprising thing. Most patients newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation are also being put on Coumadin as well by their physician. So this is a significant problem. Nobody is saying that everybody should be switched over to these medications, but probably more than the small percentage, 3 4 5% that are on them right now. So let's start there. So that is the nature of the problem. How would you get started? So if your task was this, to design a health services implementation science intervention, let's say for the Department of Medicine here at UH, that's it, okay. We won't worry about the wider world out there. Something that will improve the uptake of neural oral anticoagulants. It doesn't matter which one it is. Let's just say one or the other. Something that will improve the uptake. Where would you get started with that? How would you get started? Okay, let's say that Dr. Armitage has given you all the money you need to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you are assuming that one of the barriers is that people don't know how to prescribe these in appropriate patients. Okay, all right. What else? Where else would you start? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. So targeting. Kind of the opinion leaders who would be cardiologists who deal with AFib. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Good. Okay. So a lot of information stuff. So there is a perception that they are very expensive and they're not covered by insurance. And they are covered by insurance. Uh, they are much more expensive than Coumadin. But when you incorporate the cost of monitoring, it comes out to be less. Okay. Anything else as a starting point? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, so her comment was about physicians may not even know about the superiority of these agents. First of all, there's superiority in preventing the negative outcome of interest, which is stroke, plus uh, how good is that evidence, where has it been published, et cetera. So there might be huge knowledge gaps. So a way to, to start that I think all of that's all very relevant is to start with the necessary background information. And that uh, what we did was we started by interviewing cardiologists, general internists, and family doctors in Chicago um, to find out what their perceptions were. Uh, the cardiologists were all gung-ho. Uh, a lot of them would adopt newer medications. But the primary care physicians were much, much more hesitant. Um, and they had a number of specific concerns about it. First of all, as all of you have indicated, the knowledge was extremely poor, right? So, you know, when I see a commercial for Zarelto on TV, even if it's got... Uh, <coughs> Arnold Palmer and, I don't know, who else, Tom Brady or someone else on there, I, I still kind of tune out, you know, I, I, I just don't want to deal with it, it's like, give me my Coumadin sort of thing. So, 
even despite a lot of attention that these medications has, have received, the, uh, the knowledge base is extremely low. People do not know, for example, you don't need to monitor carefully. Uh, someone had indicated that people don't know that these are covered by insurance. They don't know that they're cost effective. And they don't know they're more effective in preventing stroke. Then, uh, in addition to poor knowledge, <clears throat> the clinicians we interviewed also um, had some legitimate concerns. Uh, the number one thing is that these are not reversible. You can't give them vitamin K, for example, and, and I can see some people getting anxious about that already, right? So um, you just have to kind of wait for the effect to, to, to wear off. And, of course, that makes people nervous as well. Um, but, you know, they're coming out with a reversible agent uh, fairly soon. So some of that background information we could provide. Let's say you've collected your background information that shows very, very poor knowledge, uh, but a health system that is very keen on promoting the uptake of these. Um, evidence, as you mentioned, that is very, very strong. What would you then do to incorporate this into practice more systematically? How would you go about it? Where would you start? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So EMR order set presenting this as an option. Okay. And let's and that we'll call clinical decision support. That's important. Okay. What else would you do? Yeah, um, you could do that. They used to do that a lot. Uh, probably not a good idea. <laughs> what else might you do? Let's just go back to a more, um, let's, yeah, let's go to this framework here. Anything else we could do? This is Ralph Pen. That's part of the characteristics of the intervention, right? Okay, so let's go through this a little bit more systematically. So this is one framework, and this is why frameworks are so useful, right? So I asked you, how would you get started? And a lot of people don't know. Um, and usually when, when they don't know, they, they switch to common sense because oh, I'm going to do a grand rounds on AFib management and the new oral anticoagulants, and that's going to, you know, after the grand rounds, everybody's going to switch from Coumadin to the new oral, antico oral anticoagulants. Of course, that's not true. So if we look at the first thing is the characteristics of the intervention. So um, this includes the evidence strength. So we can talk to people about how, how good the evidence is from recent studies. The relative advantage, which I've already talked to you about. There are some distinct advantages. Here's something that we did not talk about much is adaptability and trialability, okay? Uh, physicians are willing to try new things as long as they can go back to what was there before, okay? Um, that's not always been true. So when most systems switched from paper to electronic health records, uh, you couldn't go back to the paper. And so some people just retired at this point because they could, could, couldn't tolerate the paper record. But, but for most interventions, if you say to someone, okay, you've got patients with AFib, I want you to consider prescribing this to a couple of your patients. And if it doesn't work out, you know, if you're still uncomfortable, you can go back to prescribing Coumadin. Presenting an intervention that way is more likely to make it successful, believe it or not. So adaptability and triability are important. Design, quality, and cost, we, uh, we um, approach all of these things. Then we have to talk about structural characteristics, networks, and communication culture, and implementation climate. Now, one suggestion was that if we can kind of look at what the cardiologists are doing, and if they're adopting this, maybe they can influence everybody else within the culture. What else would help within the culture of the department? To, to promote uptake of these medications. Yes. Of course, right. So, I mean, I think educating people about the insurance and barrier issue, but what else culturally might help? How do you change the culture of a, a unit or 
Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, so, so essentially you're hinting at the same thing, and that is you need to have an opinion leader or somebody like Dr. Armitage. If he says, I always prescribe these for my new patients with AFib. Well, I, I was the first one to ever use vancom you know, everyone uses it. <laughs> there you go. So he's a trendsetter. So somebody like that, right, uh, has a much more powerful influence than anything else. We know from health services research that the influence of peers is much more powerful than the latest article from the New England Journal or anything else that you can do. One of the systems that, uh, one of the, the goals that I have long term, um, it, and it's, it's to improve diagnostic thinking and diagnostic processes a great deal. And one of our objectives is that if you have a patient with low back pain coming into you for the first time, and you know you're probably not supposed to get an MRI, um, and you can send out guidelines and put them in people's mailboxes. You can show people how it's not necessary. But something that pops up on your screen and says, did you know that 95% of your colleagues are not ordering an MRI at the first visit of a patient like this with back pain? You're, not gonna, you're probably not going to do it. You can still go ahead and do it, but that's going to be much more powerful. So the influence of, peer, uh, of peers is all important in terms of changing the culture. In terms of the outer setting, patient needs and resources, I think we've, we've approached that. Someone has suggested someone who can look up their insurance, uh, et cetera, um, peer pressure, external policies and incentives. We can, we can talk about that. It comes from the outside. Individuals involved, uh, generally speaking, to make something like this successful, you want to have a champion, okay? Probably not someone like Dr. Armitage because he would have influence anyway, but somebody, one of you maybe, who says, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in AFib, and I want to get my fellow residents and, and some of the, my other colleagues to, to get on the bandwagon. I've read a lot about it. I'm going to talk to them about it. I'm going to be a champion. I'm going to monitor our use of it. So that would be something, um, that would be one particular approach to it. And then the process itself, you would follow a very specific fr uh, framework. For example, adapting the knowledge to local needs, monitoring, evaluating, and going through it over and over time, uh, again, until it, uh, until it was adopted to your satisfaction. So a much more complex process than simply hoping for the best diffusing or, dis or disseminating. This is a deliberate process. So we think about it as um, uh, hoping it will happen, which is diffusion, right? Uh, you know, helping it happen, which is considered to be dissemination. This is called making it happen. So setting a target, saying we want half of our pat patients with new onset atrial fibrillation to be on one of these new drugs by the end of 2017. I'm not saying that's, that's a, a worthwhile goal or not, but it might be something to look at and say, how do I get there, per se? What implementation steps do I need? Okay? So, in summary, um, what we did was we covered the essential differences between implementation research and the traditional research enterprise, which I think is critically important. I can tell you that this is a new and exciting area. Um, it's very important because a lot of us, myself included, started out as clinicians. I was a rural physician in northern Ontario before I did my research fellowship um, 20 years ago. And I can tell you that um, um, many of you will probably go into clinical care and, and really think about the problems of uptake and implementation uh, every single day. And so this becomes a worthy, uh, worthwhile entry point into research as well. It's much harder to to go into a lab if you've been practicing for a few years already or if you've never been in one before. But this is a, a useful entry point. Plus, the, the good news is I think that finally, uh, the recent election, despite that, despite that, I think a lot of resources are going to be put into health services research and implementation science so that we can get better value for, the, for our healthcare dollars across the country. Okay, thanks very much. We'll take some questions.